Hi, I'm Christine Smith, the chef and naturalist aboard the David B. And I'm also a lover of wildlife and landscape photography. If you've ever wondered why we have so many photography workshops on the David B, it's partly because I love having photographers on board and I find our photography workshops to be fun, engaging, and an incredible way to get to know Southeast Alaska. Captain Jeffrey and I recently sat down with our instructors, John D'Onofrio and Al Sanders, to discuss all things photo workshop on the David B. From John and Al's experience as professional photographers and instructors to many of our favorite locations. Besides discussing our workshops, we also talked a bit about the David B. itself, and we give you a preview of some of the amazing food I'll be making for you along the way. I promise you a photography workshop aboard the David B. won't leave you hungry artistically or physically. If you have any questions about our trips, please visit our website, northwestnavigation.com. Thank you so much for joining us for our photography workshops aboard the motor vessel David B. My name is Sarah. I'm going to be your host and facilitator. Uh, you Hopefully you're seeing the shared screen of Christine with our presentation. And then we have uh, our thumbnails of our presenters, Christine and Jeffrey, Al and John and myself. Um, as we go through this, how it's going to be, uh, please type your questions in our chat room. And uh, at the end of the presentation, we will open it up to questions. Uh, so hopefully answer all your questions about what it's like to take a photography workshop aboard the Motor Vessel David B. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Jeffrey and Christine. So yeah, so the whole idea of this is to talk about these uh, trips that we do on board the Motor Vessel David B. And uh, first, a little bit about who we are. Uh, Christine and I have been running the boat now for 17 seasons. We're going into our 18th year. I uh, came to boats by working on the wind jammers that were on the East Coast. And uh, Christine uh, and I met. And uh, we bought the boat together and uh, started uh, restoring it. And now we're running the boat uh, on trips in uh, Alaska and in British Columbia and in Washington. And my name is Christine, and I'm the chef and the naturalist on the David B. And I got my start on boats when I met Jeffrey. And then the first year I worked on a boat was in 2000 and. I think it was 2000, it was on a whale watch boat, and I just absolutely fell in love with doing that. Um, for my naturalist side, I have done uh, things like I volunteered <coughs> for a uh, eagle watching program on the Skagit River as an interpreter, and I volunteered doing work as a wildlife rescuer and helped to start a wildlife rescue here in Bellingham where we live. And then also on my chef side, I have a, a certificate in pastry and in my photography side, I worked for a photographer after college for a while and grew up with some parents who had a camera store. And then I had a dark room in uh, my garage growing up. Al, tell us about yourself. Um, I'm Alan, oh, that's me in the red. Um, I've been making photographs, oh, since the 70s. I started back in another life. I was a surveyor working in the bush in Alaska and had a camera and was making photogra photographing the landscape. Um, and that uh, I evolved to where I got, I was doing more and more photography and decided that at some point I decided that that was way more fun than surveying. So I quit the surveying gig and uh, started a commercial photography business, um, doing mostly advertising, public relations. Um, I did a lot of work for artists and arts organizations. That was a lot of fun. Um, and about the same time, um, I uh, started a uh, dark room and studio rental business. Um, this was also in Anchorage. Um, and that's actually where I started teaching. I quickly figured out, oh, I was also doing custom printing for people um, because we had a dark room, both co color and black and white. Um, if anybody remembers Cibachrome, um, there's lots of horror stories that go along with printing Cibachrome. Um, and that's where I started teaching was, it, we quickly figured out that the best way to drum up business for the dark room was to teach people how to use the dark room. 
So I started teaching the darkroom to people and that slowly, eventually uh, ended up being, I got hired to teach uh, at, the, at um, uh, the University of Alaska Anchorage. And that's when I got hooked on teaching. That was just so much fun. Um, then we moved from Anchorage to down to Washington, to Bellingham, Washington. Uh, this was in 1990. And um, I, so I taught for a little while at uh, Western Washington University in Bellingham. And start, uh, after that, started teaching at the community college. Um, and I've been teaching there ever since. That's about 30 some years now. And, and now I also, besides that, I also teach with John um, here on the David B in uh, mostly in Alaska. And it has just been a lot of fun. It's just a kick to watch light bulbs go on. And anyway, we can talk more about that later. John. Yeah, uh, hi. Uh, I came to photography via painting. This was more than 40 years ago and I was studying painting at Rutgers University. And um, I fell under the, uh, the spell of a photographer named Arnold Henderson, who um, some of you may have heard of, uh, and began making serious photographs uh, around that time, some, something like 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. I've had work published in many, many publications, some coffee table books, uh, calendars, et cetera. I've uh, been shown in, in galleries in, in New York and LA and, and the Pacific Northwest. Um, and I, um, in addition to photography, I'm a writer. And I began uh, publishing and editing Adventures Northwest Magazine in 2012, uh, something that I uh, is uh, a passionate joy in my life, which I do now. Uh, as well as for the last nine years, working with Al, uh, leading photography workshops um, uh, here in the North Cascades, in the San Juan Islands, and um, most enjoyably in Southeast Alaska. So uh, it's, uh, it's as much fun as one could expect to have and get paid for it. <laughs> and Sarah? <clears throat> yeah, and you know, I, I, as you're hearing about us. I want to actually uh, give everybody who's online a chance to talk about them too, themselves too. So I'm going to do a quick poll while I'm chatting uh, about everybody else's who's online. We have 47 participants right now. And so I want to launch our poll about your photography experience. So I'm just going to open that up for um, the participants. Go at it for about a minute or so. Uh, so everybody feel free to answer your questions. Um, and in the meantime, let me just uh, share a few things about myself. Again, my name is Sarah. Um, if you've ever emailed or called Northwest Navigation, usually I'm the first person you chat with. And it's been my honor to work with Jeffrey and Christine for the since 2014. That's been um, really been an enjoyable thing for me to help them um, with their vision to get people to experience the wilderness of Alaska. I come from an engineering background, which is kind of a strange place to be in here, but really I've always had a passion of helping people. Um, and so engineering and business and just kind of overall just wanting to help people. And so it's been always really a lot of fun to chat with everybody. To, and then I've had a chance to go to Alaska and the San Juan Islands myself. So I like to really speak from experience when I'm talking with folks about what it's like to be on the David B. And uh, again, I just wanna thank everybody for being here. I've had the poll open for about a minute now and I think pretty much 100% have, have answered. So I'm gonna end the poll and share the results so that we can kind of see where is everybody who's on our, um, event for tonight, it looks like we have about 56% of people are saying they've been confidently making photographs for quite some time. Uh, a third of that are going fairly comfortable with their camera, but hoping to learn more. 8% um, being I've had my camera for a little while, but still trying to learn. And then about 3% being newbies. So thank you so much for participating in that poll. And then I'm gonna just again, remind everybody that uh, we're recording, and so if you have any questions, type them into our chat room, and that um, we're going to continue on with our presentation. So we offer these trips for uh, these photography workshops uh, in Southeast Alaska. Here's all of uh, the top part of North America, and the trips you can see are in that section uh, where the colors are. 
Here's a little more blow up just showing just Alaska. And then here's the actual area of the Southeast. We um, have these, uh, let me turn on pointer here. We, uh, this area over here is Glacier Bay and we do uh, trips over here in Glacier Bay that are part of our workshops. These two on this side overlap, but the bigger one, uh, the blue area shows the trips that go to Pack Creek, as well as the fjords on the side. And then the one just in the red there, that trip is uh, just towards the fjords uh, in that area along the mainland side. So people often ask, why do you, why would people want to go to Alaska for a photography workshop? And we like to say it's partly because of the wildlife and the scenery, as well as um, the scenery. And then what we kind of like to call that is our sort of whales, glaciers, and bears. And so, like Jeffrey said, this is where we go. We go to Glacier Bay National Park. And then we've got a trip that goes to uh, Admiralty Island for Pat Creek Bears and then back over to the mainland, uh, Tracy Arm and Ford's Terror. And then we have one trip that's pretty special that just stays within Tracy Arm and Ford's Terror. And we're not going to talk about these trips, but we do offer photography trips in the San Juan Islands in Washington State, but we'll save those for another day. So Glacier Bay National Park, that trip is on June 13th through the 20th this year. And so what we like about it is that from Juneau, it's about a day's, um, day's uh, half a day's to, excuse me, it takes two days to get to um, Glacier Bay. So what we do, as you can see on the screen, Jeffrey's got the pointer. Juneau is up in here. And then we usually spend our first night in here and then make it up into the bay somewhere on that uh, middle of that second day. And then we find Glacier Bay is a really, really amazing place to uh, get out and explore. And I think we'll let John and Al talk a little bit about, um, about the next couple of slides and kind of what it feels like to be in Glacier Bay as a photographer. Yeah, it feels awfully good. It's uh, Glacier Bay is a UNESCO World Heritage Site recognized internationally as one of the most beautiful places on planet Earth. And um, there's there, that's no accident. Uh, the thing about Glacier Bay is that the scale is so immense. It's almost uh, impossible to wrap your head around sometimes. And yet th there's also such fine details and um, the sorts of uh, emerging plant life, et cetera, as this vast area is emerging from, from the ice age and you can see the colonization of plants. So, so you have a, a thousand different variations on a theme of wild beauty. Uh, and it's we've been there many, many times and it's different every single time and it is never less than spectacular. Al, do you want to? Yeah, add? sorry, I was unmuted. I'm I'm back now. Sorry. Can can you can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Yes. Yeah, I got unmuted for some reason. Sorry. Um, um, probably to everybody's advantage. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> it's not easy to mute you. Yeah. <laughs> um, Glacier Bay is just spectacular. Um, the, the interesting thing about Glacier Bay is it is well, this is true everywhere, but it's particularly true in in Glacier Bay is you it is changing rapidly um when uh, george vancouver first came through here uh 200 years ago um there was no glacier bay the entrance to glacier bay is where the glaciers started um and a hundred years later when when uh, john muir was there it was back about 40 miles and a hundred years after that, which is now when we're going in there, it's changing rapidly. I was there 40 years ago on a kayak trip and um, uh, glaciers that were, were um, tidewater are now moving back and you can see how quickly it's changing. So it's an ever dynamic um, landscape. Um, actually, this makes me think of one of the things that I find interesting, this is one of Christine's slides, but um, one of the things that I find interesting is 
the, not just the spectacular broad landscape, which is great fun, but it's just the small details. Um, and what's also interesting, this also this slide brings this to mind, is as the glaciers move back, you can see the um, land transforming. Now there are flowers where there were none. It's just it's just fun to watch the transformation of the landscape. Christine's big thing is always the wildlife. Yeah. In terms of taking <laughs> pictures. Yeah, I so it's something that I, I really enjoy, uh, seeing the wildlife. And Glacier Bay has a lot of uh, very iconic wildlife um, that's uh, seen throughout uh, southeast Alaska. So there are brown and black bears. This is a grizzly bear, which we call brown bears. Uh, mountain goats are common to see and to be able to photograph. This was photographed in Glacier Bay. All of these pictures were uh, photographed in Glacier Bay. And so mountain goats and sea otters, which um, we don't see them as commonly in other areas of Southeast Alaska, but Glacier Bay, um, you're definitely guaranteed to see sea otters. They've made a big resurgence. Yep. It's they also travel in packs. Yes. <laughs> it's also interesting because of the skiff, which we'll talk about later, we're able to get uh, quite close to, to the animals uh, without disturbing them. And, um, and that's uh, pretty awesome for being able to be in there to take pictures. It's uh, one, of the, one of the beauties of Glacier Bay is there's so much wildlife, but also our setup, we're able to get quite close. And people often ask, uh, where am I going to see puffins if they want to photograph puffins? Uh, Glacier Bay is definitely a place to, to find them. Their South Marble Island is a um, place where we find them nesting. And so we get to watch them flying. We see them with small fish in their beaks. And then also in around Marjorie Glacier. And I think we've seen them in Gloomy Knob too in that area as well. And then of course, humpback whales. Those are... Um, kind of something that will greet us as we enter a gla Glacier Bay. They have an area there that they call whale waters where you have to take extra special precautions. But what's nice about that is it gives us the opportunity to see humpback whales. And Jeffrey. We haven't talked much about the boat. The boat that we operate is a restored boat from the 1920s. And um, we've set it up to do exactly what we're doing on these trips. We, uh, it's got uh, an ice guard on the hull. So days like this are, uh, are not worry-free, but they definitely, it allows us to go through the ice and be in places like this. Um, and then we'll show you later some of the inside that we've set up specifically to be able to do photography trips. And Jeffrey does a really good job of picking out the anchorages that um, we spend time at. And that's, Dependent on the, you know, the weather and the tides. And because we do have an itinerary and that itinerary um, is one that we kind of move around a little bit depending upon if we think it's gonna be a nicer day at the glacier on one day versus another day. So we've got a lot of um, time to play around. So unlike maybe some of the bigger boats you might be familiar with that you might do a photography workshop shop on, we have six days out of an eight day trip that are in the bay. So that gives us time to decide if we're gonna go to one side of the arm or the one side of the bay or the other side of the bay and just sort of plan it by more what's happening and what the landscape is gonna to reveal to us. And uh, before you guys uh, leave Glacier Bay, I wanna talk about how that we're one of the few concessionaires that are allowed into Glacier Bay. And uh, for the last 10 years is that we've got that contract. Yeah, we have a 10 year concession contract with Glacier Bay National Park and Preserve. And um, like Sarah said, it does mean that there aren't that many other boats uh, allowed to be in there overall. And then on any given day, the concession contract limits it to just six of the boats like us. And uh, it's a huge area. It's uh, 60 miles long, up one arm. It's longer than that on the other side. There's lots and lots of space to spread out. And, uh, and that means that we don't see very many people as well. It's amazing how few other boats, when you think about it, you know, and, and the thing about Glacier Bay too, is once you get past uh, Bartlett Cove, I mean, not only are there almost no boats, there's no, 
virtually no sign of humankind at all. There's no structures, no houses, no even virtually no trails. So it's a chance to really get into honest to God wilderness in a profound way and still from the from the comfort of the David B. It's it's pretty good. So um, the second trip that we have that we offer is um, uh, to Pat Creek. It actually involves Pat Creek, uh, which is a bear viewing area, and it's on Admiralty Island. And then it also goes into uh, Tracy Arm Ford's Terror. It's a one-way trip that starts in Juneau and goes all the way down to Petersburg. And you can kind of see those three, uh, three dots on your screen. Up on the left where I think it says Cube Cove, there's actually a place there uh, that is Pat Creek. And that's where um, there's been a uh, wilderness preserve for uh, grizzly bears and call them brown bears. And those bears have been habituated and the area is run between um, the U.S. Forest Service and Alaska Department of Fish and Game. So we have permits to go ashore there and it's a pretty amazing place to get to know, uh, to get to observe wild bears. And then we um, will leave Pat Creek and head over to Tracy Iron Ford's Terror and that's uh, another wilderness area. And we'll spend a couple days there before heading down to uh, the Petersburg area. And that place where that next little dot is, is uh, Thomas Bay. And there's a really beautiful anchorage that we like in there called Scenery Cove. It has a glacier that's not tidewater any longer, but it's really close. Yes. So what makes Pat Creek particularly special is, and we're going to start this in Pat Creek, is that it is a place where bears and humans kind of cohabitate, um, and they're used to one another, and it's really not uncommon on the beach to see a, a scene like this where you've got boot prints and bear prints all on the same tide. Yeah, it's, it. you know, I've I photographed wildlife for 30 some odd years. I've never had an experience like this. I know there are a few other places, um, the Brooks River, uh, et cetera, where people can get pretty close to bears. Uh, however, from what I understand, you wait in line in most of those places and there's crowds. At Pack Creek, that's not the case. And we, we get to inhabit this little area that is sort of the, the human area. And the bears are used to people being in this little spot and they will come. How close do you think, Al? We, we bears have come to us. Been, there. There's a there's a slide coming up in a little bit. You'll see. It's maybe yeah. 20 feet. Yeah, um, it's just unbelievable. It's, it's amazing. And they couldn't care less that you're there. They're so used to people being there. As long as you're respectful, um, they're they just go about their business and couldn't care less that we're there. Yeah, we we photographed the the cubs playing wrestling with each other. There they are um, in the background. Yeah, there you go. And um, mating behaviors uh, amongst the adults. It is just, uh, you know, it's it's an experience. It's a once in a lifetime experience. Um, and uh, the, the opportunity, be, because we're on land, we have tripods, we're in a nice stable <laughs> position. Conditions are excellent for capturing really, really high quality photographs. Here you can see, um, this is how close we get. Um, they're, I like they're to think just, of it the other way around, Al. I think this is how close they get. That's <laughs> true. They came to us. We didn't go to them. You'll notice the logs, the, the log that these people are sitting on, and the woman in the, in the front in the blue hat, she's sitting on another log. There's four logs that create this rectangle, and that's the people area. And the bears know that, and the bears know, and we know that outside that log is the bear area, and everybody respects everybody's space. Um, and the bears, they couldn't care less that you're there. And and can, I got to tell the story of these two. Um, this was John was suggesting with the, as John was saying, we were we're often there um, in May, which is when this was, which is mating season. And these two were just a kick. Um, that's the female on the left and the male on the right. And he was smitten. This bear couldn't, he 
could not take his eyes off of her. She'd get up, he'd get up. She'd sit down, he'd sit down. She'd move over there, he'd move over there. Um, he just stared at her and followed her all day. And we spent the whole day um, watching these bears. And it was just a kick watching their interaction. Um, just, it was just too much fun. Yeah, no, I think there's so many great stories from Pat Creek and definitely uh, one of the highlights of this trip. But uh, we do leave Pat Creek and we move on to other areas. And so this is also another anchorage on Admiralty Island. And where we're gonna head for the rest of the trip is over where that mountain was in the background. And, and kind of what I wanna talk about now is that we spent a lot of time ashore and also in the forest and in maybe some other spots. And if you look at the look at the shoreline there, it looks like the forest is pretty darn impenetrable. Impenetra anyhow. <laughs> it's really and, hard to get into. It's really <laughs> hard to get into. Plus it's dense. <laughs> yeah. And um, anyhow, so, but once you do find that spot to get into the forest, it's a really magical area. And I love to take people into the forest it's soft, it's squishy, the light is dappled and beautiful, and sometimes there's really big things that we find in the forest, like some ancient trees. And But then you can also kind of dial down, and the forest has all sorts of beautiful little treasures, like this shy maiden, and sort of thing you kind of have to get down on your hands and knees to find, but there's lots of beautiful little plants inside the forest different types of fungus and lichen you can find and the details are are just exquisite and and just very delicate flowers and then even one of my favorite ones which is this fairy slipper that's coming up and then um, and I love to get down into those tiny little places but I think one of the things that both John and Al do really really amazing things with are the big landscapes that this area affords and so maybe John and Al you want to talk about that yeah, there are so many opportunities to frame the landscapes. You know, there's there's always the water and the changing light. And some of these landscapes are just unbelievably dramatic. I've spent a lot of my life photographing in mountain ranges around the world. And these mountains just really have something special. Part of it is the the absolute raw untouched nature of it but part of it too is the radical topography and although unlike glacier bay these weren't covered in ice very very recently you can still see the effects of uh ice everywhere you go um this is well uh what i was going to also say about the the landscape is we've been there in just about any kind of weather you can imagine and it's not only different, but it's always spectacular, whether it's a bluebird sky sunny day like the last few slides or something like this, where it might even be raining a little bit. Um, and those you get those wonderful misty clouds. It's always dynamic. It's always changing. And there's it's always beautiful. It's just incredible. Yeah. And like Ford's Terror, for example, Ford's Terror, it reminds me of Yosemite Valley except that it's got this beautiful fjord at the base of it. And there's only uh, 12 people in the entire fjord. It's uh, how many waterfalls? I mean, when depending on the- well, There's the, gotta be hundreds. The day, hundred, and these are not little waterfalls. These are, you know, 500, 800,000 foot waterfalls on all sides. It's just amazing. And to have it to ourselves is, it, it's hard to describe the feeling. The, it's, there are, there's so many waterfalls that are, yeah, 500 to 1,000 feet tall, any one of which in anywhere else in North America would have um, a 600-car parking lot and a gift, a gift shop attached, and these don't even have names. Yeah. And there's hundreds of them. And you're the, like John said, we're the only ones there. Um, that's because you can't get, Ford's Terror is difficult to get into. Big boats cannot go there. It can, you can only get in there in a small boat. We, uh, on these trips that go to Pack Creek, we also go to both Tracy Arm or so sometimes one both, but one or the other, Tracy Arm or Endicott Arm, and uh, spend some time drifting around in front of a Tidewater Glacier over on this side of the, of the panhandle. 
Yeah. And to get up close to a glacier, Jeffrey, well, if the ice conditions are right, we can get safely about a quarter mile up to the face of a glacier. And um, the, the sport there is to wait for uh, ice to come off it and hopefully we'll see some big calving like that. And so that's one of the, the highlights of that trip. But then also, even though we've been to Pat Creek and we've seen wildlife, there's still plenty of opportunity um, in the fjords for finding things like black bears, brown bears, killer whales, humpback whales, different types of birds and everything. So there's lots of wildlife as well. Our third type of trip that we offer in Southeast is specifically in those two fjords. We spend uh, all but one night in the fjords themselves in Tracy Arm, which is pretty famous, and Endicott Arm, which is less famous, but still just as amazing. And um, at the ends up by the glaciers, both of those spots have uh, lots of places with the same kind of waterfalls that we were talking about in Ford's Terror. Um, it's all amazingly beautiful. This is the the area that shows that with the two fjords. Um, this one down here, this long one is Endicott Arm, and there's Dawes Glacier at the end of it. Um, Jeffrey, point out uh, Ford's Terror. This spot right here is Ford's Terror, and uh, the bigger boats can get into about here, and we can go quite a ways back into the back of this. And then um, this other spot over here, this whole big long arm is Tracy Arm, and at the end of it, there's a glacier in in uh, a side fjord over here and another one at the end of it over here that we can get up to. And uh, so that whole trip uh, starts and ends in Juneau and uh, spends its whole time in that uh, area of the fjords. And one of the things I think is, is different about this trip compared to the other trip um, that includes the fjords and Pat Creek is that we don't we don't spend quite as much time underway each day, just a few hours possibly. So we'll go to one place, there's lots more time to be ashore doing um, uh, doing photography, uh, both on the boat, in the skiff and ashore. Where the Pat Creek trip, we do spend a lot of time ashore um, at Pat Creek and then there's more underway time. So we might be spending more time doing whale photography or stuff from the boat. And then we do several forest hikes and other types of hikes as well. And did you want to call out the boots in this I particular we photo? Should. I was we going to mention thinking. that. Yes. <laughs> I wonder why we're thinking about boots all of a sudden. <laughs> so, one of the things we've done to set up the David B, so it works really well for doing all these hikes in the wet, mossy uh, forest, uh, is that and for getting in and out of the boat. In, yes, and getting in and out of the boat at the beach. A lot of times, we have uh, boots for everybody. We have a set of boots uh, of all different sizes, uh, and we uh, can fit out everybody so that not only can you use these great boots to tromp through the water and look at stuff in the shallows, but also in the muddy spots, and you don't have to worry about dragging them with you on the airplane. We also uh, have a great skiff. You can see a little bit of it here. Um, for uh, getting into a lot of really tight little spots, this narrow little spots, probably only about 30 feet wide. Um, and uh, it's really stable uh, for taking <laughs> pictures. Sadly, nobody, nobody uh, uh, selected a slide for this that was everybody standing up in the skiff, but that happens pretty frequently and it's really stable and you're able to do that. Yeah, so this picture and the next picture are both from Ford's Terror, and this is just a little tiny side canyon that uh, has this just amazing waterfall, and with the skiff, we can just poke right up into it, and I think this is one of John's slides, and um, it's just, yeah, it's a really, really beautiful spot, and again, another a spot that a lot of people don't get to go to. The top of that waterfall probably comes out of off the top of the hill there between 2,500 and 3,000 feet up and comes all the way down to the ocean water through this little slot. Humbling, it's humbling. Very much so. Yeah, and this is in the uh, back of Ford's Terror. And so you kind of see how tall some of these uh, cliff faces are. And then also in the back of Ford's Terror. If I had to pick 
under comes under the heading of pick your favorite child. If I had to pick a favorite spot in Southeast, um, it would have to be Ford's Terror. Yeah. It's certainly my favorite anchorage of all the places that we go mm -hmm. in on all of our trips. Depends on the day. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so true. So, oh, oh go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, no. So I was going to say, um, yeah, so we do, besides going ashore, spending a lot of time Ford's Terror, another place, Wood Spit, um, and some other spots, um, we spend a lot of time, you know, looking at the glaciers and, again, watching them cab. So here's another cabbing. This one's at South Sawyer, and uh, it's just a really spectacular opportunity. You know, the, the, the blue of glaciers just sort of defines blue. I've been fortunate enough a couple of times to photograph uh, flowing lava from volcanoes. And, and I've always thought that's orange. That there is no orange to compete with that. And I feel the same way about the blue of, the, of these uh, tidewater glaciers. That's what, what they used to call sacre blue, right? Back in the Renaissance, sacred blue, the color of heaven. We had somebody on the boat at one point who said, when I take these pictures home to my friends and family, they're not gonna believe that I didn't mess with them because of this color, because that's actually what it looks like. That's yeah. not that's not an altered picture. They'll make a little altered, but not, not altered <laughs> in a new way. Right. We're gonna uh, talk about altering in yeah. a minute. Right? <laughs> yeah. The color isn't altered. Yeah, yet. yeah, the color's not altered in that. Um, this uh, this trip also, like the other uh, other trip with Pat Creek, has a lot of opportunity for wildlife photography. There's um, so many animals that call Tracy Armford's Terror home. So, the harbor seals they come in uh, to have their um, babies on the ice floes. So we see them uh, predominantly in June and July, or excuse me, uh, in June. And then in the summer months, there's just beautiful dragonflies. There's lots of wetlands, and so we see lots of small, small wildlife. And then also, also the mountain goats. Uh, we see those commonly near uh, near the glaciers, and so they're a a fun, fun thing to watch. And they do sometimes come right down to the water as well. That one looks a little motley. I know, <laughs> I know. You know, it didn't go to the hairdresser ahead of time. Yeah, he's been through the ringer. Yeah. So this is sort of, uh, this next little section here is kind of the typical photography workshop on the David B. And here you can see John and Al, and this is at uh, Marjorie. It's just contemplating, contemplating life. I know, you know, and they're probably scheming of something, um, something <laughs> and, that you're do. And maybe this yeah. is why we have two instructors. This is yes. a, you can get a full. So, we're actually you. probably <laughs> talking talking about how good lunch was. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> or actually, I think what we were doing was scheming how we can steal the chocolate chip cookies. Yeah. Without Christine noticing. <laughs> so ahead, why now. two of us? That's a good question. Um, couple of reasons that works out. One is with two people, two of us, um, and even though the, the David B um, can only hold a maximum of eight people, but with two of us, that gives that much more one-on-one -on -one time um, with each of us. Plus, we both, um, if one of us doesn't know some, about something, the other one will. Um, so that's a good thing. But also, um, it's always good to have more than one perspective on things. Um, we both have different ways of looking at things. And so getting uh, more than one view of um, when, review, when we're reviewing people's work um, is actually quite helpful. I think having two people and, and, and the two of us playing off of each other, um, I think works really well. It's just a lot of fun. I think that is a lot of fun I, when you guys are are on the ground together with people. You really make it um, super fun for people, and I think they like to join in on that too. A lot of banter, which is always always fun. Right. Well, we're we're really passionate about it. You know, we're not we're not just along for the ride. We come back with a lot of a lot of images also, and you know, I I think that we share our passion. I mean, every day is it's like the equivalent of of two weeks in regular life in terms of the, the sorts of experiences that one can expect to have in a day. I mean, it's visual beauty just nonstop, you know, at a at a very, very high level, along with 
um, sort of the um, an opportunity to really refine one's skill set. And it's so helpful to be around other people and see how a group of people photographs the same thing in different ways and to learn technical uh, technical tricks and just ways to, to really um, refine your particular way of seeing the world. I mean, it really starts with seeing. And after, after there's a, a very deep level of seeing, then what tools do we use to bring that vision to life in a way that um, other people, that communicates to other people, that touches other people? As serious as all that is, lest you think we have no fun, <laughs> this is our, our deckhand. <laughs> and then there's That's, that. She was a kid. That was so much fun. You know, which, which brings me, you know, there's something uh, going back to teaching um, something I've been I've learned <laughs> since I've been doing this for 170 years. Oh, there's there's Sherry. There's Sherry. Um, one of the things I've learned about teaching is a, a good part of teaching is entertainment. If we can make the experience fun, you're going to be more open to learning and you will learn more. So it's, as you can see from Sherry here laughing at us, um, um, it, the, the, we're, at, we're laughing all the time. We're having a good time. And hopefully that, um, uh, if you're having a good time, you're going to learn more. And that's I, I, something I've learned over the years. Yeah, I think I think about one in four, we, we hand out evaluation forms, and maybe it's one in four, one in six, maybe, uh, of the people who, who fill these forms out, describe the trip as the best trip of their life. So that's, that says a lot. I'd just like to point out, this is why there's nobody else in Ford's Terror. This is the entrance to Ford's Terror. Um, it's maybe, what, 100 feet across. And nothing but a small boat can go in. When the tide is running, it's a river. The trick is to go in at slack tide. And this sort of gives you an idea of what the landscape is like for, uh, for photography, what you'll be walking on, um, how close we can get to things. This is Marjorie Glacier in uh, uh, Glacier Bay. And you can see everybody's up there on the crest of this um, little uh, sandbar or gravel bar that the glacier had left behind. And so that's one of the places that, um, that's one of the types of uh, uh, footing that you would be walking on. Right, but, but what needs to be known is that you're dropped off uh, by the skiff and then you've got this strenuous hike of 200 feet. <laughs> yes. Across a flat spit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We had this skiff uh, custom designed so that it can go right up onto the rocks like this. And then there's stairs just inside there and you can walk right out the front of it. And this is another illustration of why you want the boots. Uh, in front of glaciers, um, there's a lot of mud. And so it's another reason that we provide boots and, and you can just kind of be prepared to have muddy feet. And then here, this is at Lamplu Glacier, and it's a spot where, as you can see, there's all the ice that uh, is on the beach, and you can spend a lot of time uh, photographing that uh, again and again for days and days, and it's never the same, but you can also go up into some higher spots and get some different images there. And here's a, another ice picture that kind of gives you an idea that you could concentrate for hours in one little spot, or you can just move around. It's like a sculpture garden. There's the skiff. And what there's a... kind of something you see in every direction. No matter, no matter where you want to focus, there's something, uh, definitely something to make good pictures from. Whether on the skiff or on the boat. Or on the David B. Yeah. Or on the land. Yeah. This waterfall, we get close enough to where you could you could pretty much reach out with a cup and get yourself a drink. You might get a little damp, but you could do it. 
So one thing that uh, people often ask if they're not traveling, uh, if they're traveling with somebody who doesn't uh, feel like participating, um, uh, how does that work out? And we, we have a lot of cell phone uh, pictures being taken. Uh, a lot of people that are, you know, coming coming with their spouse who's very avid in, into photography and they want to join, but they don't want to actually don't want to or don't have the gear or whatever. And so there's a lot of uh, a lot of this kind of thing as well. And we kind of like to think that cell phone photography is sort of the gateway drug to like somewhat more advanced <laughs> photography. We have had actually um, non photo non photography spouses. Um, I can think of one in particular who was using her cell phone to, and, and having a good time and got so involved in it, she ended up borrowing a camera and got involved in, started getting involved in photography. So yes, it's a gateway drug. <laughs> this is what it looks like uh, on board the boat when we're actually doing one of our workshop uh, times. We have a big screen that we can pull down and a projector. And uh, here's Al teaching about uh, pontificating on something. Yeah. yeah, talking for sure. <laughs> it looks to me like he's doing a stand-up routine, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and this is kind of where you know when people ask what's it like, how it how the days are kind of broken up, you know, with photography and then instruction, and then the ability to process afterwards. If it's okay with you guys, I'm going to start our next poll. Or do you want to, well, I do okay. that. Do you want to talk about uh, Adobe Lightroom Classic? Let, let's go two more here, two more slides, okay. and then it'd be a good spot to do that. Um, okay. So people often ask about the schedule and uh, what it's like. This is a little bit more of what it looks like when people are working on their own pictures uh, while we're headed somewhere, or we're at anchor somewhere. Um, and we do have lots of uh, time for uh, other activities if you need some downtime and need to do some, some uh, time taking. Yeah, yeah, take a long time. Time. Jeffrey, yeah, could you could you go back one, Jeffrey, for just a yeah. second? I just want to point out. Can you go back back one yeah. slide? Does that work? It does. I got yeah. stuck in the pole. Oh, there we go. Um, there I want to point out the notice what the 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 people with their laptops um, are on the <laughs> custom made uh, boards. That are like uh, little desks, lap desks, lap desks. Yeah. That's what the word I was looking for. Thank you. Yeah. Um, that just make working with your laptop um, and a mouse way easier. Um, they were custom made for the David B. And they we also really have wonderful. custom made window covers and um, a skylight cover, so that when uh, when necessary, we can we can basically eliminate the light coming into this space. Uh, for uh, times when that is advantageous. And it is, it's really a deep dive in Lightroom. It's not Lightroom, we, we don't just skim over some of the, the prominent features in Lightroom. Uh, a number of people, in fact, uh, some of the people in that photograph mentioned to us that they've taken many, many, many workshops, Antarctica, all over the world, China, et cetera. And we're surprised at how in depth the uh, the processing instruction was. So, um, you know, if you're if you're into learning uh, how to really up your game in processing, it's a great opportunity. And yeah. and we 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 can accommodate all experience levels. If you're brand new to it, that's perfectly fine. Um, if you're you're an expert at it, that's perfectly fine as well. I mean, we're we can between us we can accommodate any experience level and uh from the poll that we got the adobe lightroom experience uh, about um 44 percent have been using it for a while but know that there's more uh, about 15 percent are fairly experienced with it and feel they know pretty much everything and then there's the rest are the remaining 40 are either brand new or just starting uh using lightroom classic um but then of course the reason why we use Adobe Lightroom Classic is uh, we want to talk about the Wi-Fi situation is we want it to be able so that everything's accessible on your laptop and not trying to get to the cloud in the wilderness of Alaska. Right. Once we leave Juno, there's no Wi-Fi access. Yeah, yeah. We are in the wilderness. Right. So, um, so this, one of the things we also do at the last day of the workshop 
is we have a printer on board um, and we bring out the printer. And while we're doing our final review of everybody's images, I prefer to think of them as reviews rather than critiques. Um, when we're doing a final review um, of everyone's images, we will make a print and everybody goes home with a 12 by 18 print, uh, a 12 by 18 image on 13 by 19 inch paper. And yes, we do have mailing tubes, so you don't have to fold it up and put it in your luggage. Um, but I just want to make a couple comments about printing, because most people tend not to print their images these days. Um, I come from a time when if you didn't have a print, you didn't have a photograph. Um, when you, so there's just something about the tactile feel of having a print, of having this, this object on paper that is just, uh, I, it's hard to describe. The other thing that I find interesting and that is very rarely mentioned when people talk about why you should print, when you uh, upload an image to the web, um, whether it's your website or Flickr or Facebook, doesn't matter. Um, it's really is an exercise in letting go. You have no idea how it's being viewed on the other side. You only hope that somebody is seeing it the way you intended it. <laughs> when you look at a print, a properly done print, you're seeing, there's no intermediary. You're seeing it exactly the way the photographer intended you to see it. And that can't be compared online. There's no comparison to that. So printing is, is just a wonderful thing to do. And everybody goes home with a print. Uh, we have about 10 minutes um, for our official uh, time that we've got here. So maybe we can move on a little bit so we can get a bit more on to what it's like to be on the David B in addition to the photography workshops. And then we can open it up to some questions. We do have uh, real quick some stats on the boat. We uh, have an inverter and a generator. And so we have always on electricity, um, lots and lots of outlets all over the place to charge all your devices. And uh, we also have a water maker. And so we don't have any restriction on people taking showers or anything like that. Um, we've got lots of water. We do, uh, we have a crew of three. There's two photo instructors and then uh, eight guests uh, at the max on any trip. Um, this is a little bit of what it looks like inside the boat. Christine and I uh, restored this starting in 1998 and uh, started running our first trips in uh, 2000. And six. And then a lot of what you'll see here, we actually did in another big restoration in uh, 2016, 2017. <laughs> this is what that saloon area looks like. When uh, it's clean. When it's clean and there aren't photographers cameras all over in it. Um, this is what our galley looks like. Our table here seats two on each side and we have a couple stools for the front so we can seat all eight guests here. And um, this is Christine's wood cook stove. She does all of her cooking on this stove. And then uh, we've got a self-serve drink station for, I can see that's, you know, all coffee and tea. We actually have our own brand of coffee that we have on board. And then here's a little bit of what the cabin arrangement is for the boat. You can we have, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, we have three, uh, Three state rooms with queen size beds, one state room with an over under bunk, and then there's a th uh, fourth state room in there, or fifth state, excuse me, fifth state room in there that's a crew state room, and then Jeffrey and I are in the back of the boat. Here's going down below decks to where the cabins are. There's a small flight of stairs to get down there. And then besides each cabin having its own toilet and sink, we have a shared head, a shared uh, uh, bathroom. With, so a can, with a shower with a shower and a bathtub and uh this is the cabin that has the over under bunks those are uh extra long twins and there's a bathroom in there this is uh the cabin in the middle of the boat on the port side and it has uh, a queen bunk uh sink in the front and then there's also a, a head in there as well so there's another one queen size bunk and then the third one with the queen size bunk. And that kind of takes you on a tour of the uh, downstairs of the boat. And then I think we're gonna go up uh, the back and this area is undercover. So if you're taking pictures uh, outside, this whole area stays nice and dry, but then you can also go up uh, to the top of the boat 
And you can see all that space up there is available for you. So that's great for watching whales or watching glaciers or sitting up top on a nice sunny day. People do yoga up there. It's a really great experience. And then uh, probably one of the most important things about going on a trip, especially a cruise, is the food. And here you can see a couple of bears enjoying some muffins. And we'll give you a quick overview of what a uh, day on the boat's food would be like. Here is a breakfast, full breakfast. And then uh, Al sort of mentioned the cookies. There's always a cookie thief who comes by and steals a cookie. What? Notice the missing what? cookie. I part. know. I didn't, I didn't do it. I didn't yeah. mean it. I wasn't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that I wasn't yeah, those are uh, triple ginger cookies. And then here's a shot of my uh, menu board. So we're going to have glacier views for dessert on this particular day. That was a great dessert. Yeah, mm -hmm. wasn't it good? Yeah. <laughs> and then uh, uh, soups, or lunches are typically soups. Uh, we do crabbing on board. We don't do uh, much in the way of fishing, but we do occasionally throw a crab trap down. And uh, I do a lot with uh, uh, sourdough bread. And then um, I make my own pasta. And I do like to highlight as much as I can uh, Alaskan uh, wild caught seafood. So this next, uh, oops, no, that's not the next image. That's a, a pie. That's a pie. <laughs> so uh, do pies. With and the seal of approval. The seal of approval. Yes, we'd seen some seals that day. And then here's that pasta. It's a spinach pesto pasta with uh, Alaska wild vein scallops or wind veins, wild vein, wind vein scallops. And then this is a uh, troll cot king salmon with some kelp pickles from a local uh, Juno company, and then some zucchini noodles and couscous. And I think that, oh no, that doesn't take us to the end. And then I always like to leave everybody when you're getting off the boat the last day, because it's a sad and bittersweet thing, is I'll make you croissants, pan au chocolat and regular croissants. And, and then that way you've got something to keep you warm on the inside. Christine didn't nope. really go into this, but all this food is made on board from scratch, from real ingredients and- uh, On a wood-fired stove. On, on a wood-fired cook stove, yes. Christine's food is to die for. Yeah, thanks guys. Some some people refuse to leave. <laughs> they do. <laughs> the end of the trip, it's hard to get out the door. It is, yes. Maybe this year is going to be the year we sell the uh, the sweatpants. <laughs> right. David B. sweatpants. Yes. <laughs> well, um, while we uh, while I start looking at some of the questions, I just want to open up to one final poll here um, as far as uh, just to kind of get your interests in some of the things that might uh, be of interest to you and feel free to check um, multiple choice, as many as you like. Um, but a couple of questions that I'm just going to start off with. Obviously, everybody was asking about, you know, how many passengers, how many cabins, and we do have eight passengers in four cabins. Although typically in the photography uh, workshops, it's not all eight. Uh, there's a lot of single passengers, and we do not charge extra for solo passengers. Uh, there's a couple of questions about the water. Is the water always that calm? Um, and as well as some of the wildlife. So go ahead, Jeffrey, if you want to speak to that. This area is really protected. <laughs> and so, yes, it is almost all the time this calm. Well, there's a lot of, lot of days with reflection pictures like this because the, in the fjords, the wind, the wind seldom blows in the right direction to blow the length of the fjord. And so there's a lot of very calm water. Um, on the way to and from uh, Juneau on the Glacier Bay trip, there's one slightly more exposed section, um, but uh, it isn't, none of it's, uh, none of it involves going out on the ocean and uh, rolling around in big ocean waves. Yeah, and the okay. David is pretty uh, heavy and it rides pretty well in the water. So, so it's a, it's a comfortable ride. Okay, uh, just and, to, we wanted to share the results of, uh, from everybody who participated in the polls. Uh, overwhelmingly, we've got wildlife, uh, fjords and waterfall, um, as well as glacier icebergs, uh, tide pools, and epic mountains. So thank you, participants. Let's uh, go on to some other questions. Uh, there was a question about what lens were you using, Christine, on that picture of the puffin? Uh, 
uh, somebody's never gotten that close to a puffin before. So. <laughs> yeah, that was with a uh, 150 to 600 Tamron, and okay. I have a Nikon. Okay. Um, and then uh, next question was about um, the glaciers and you know all the black as the various glaciers come together. Um, what's that black and um, you know versus the blue? The right. Spirit. So the edge of the glacier is. Uh, sitting right up next to the wall of the canyon that it's in, and it's eroding that side away. And so all that rubble from the glacier eroding that away ends up on top of and, <coughs> and mixed into the glacier. And then if uh, several, in all these glaciers we go to, several glaciers feed the main uh, stream of the glacier that we see when we're looking at the end of it. And so there are stripes in the glacier of those lines coming from the edge walls of those, of those canyons that, that are actually feeding the glacier. One of the things I like to do oftentimes at, at a meal is uh, sit down with everybody and show some, some diagrams showing exactly why those form, because they are a little bit confusing. <laughs> there okay. are lots of those medial moraines in glaciers. OK. Um... There was questions about how much time is uh, spent on shore, but I think that was pretty much covered. I like um, to, we for sure get some time ashore uh, every single day of, of each of these trips. Sometimes it's like two to three hours, and sometimes it's uh, in two different times in the day and almost double that. Yeah. Okay. There's a question about Pack Creek, about obviously being uh, Closer than 100 yards from the bears, as far as the national park uh, statistics, you want to talk about the unique um, situation there on the Pat Creek viewing area? Yeah. So it's so it's, <laughs> it's not a national park. It's actually on national forest land, um, and it's an area that the Forest Service has set up specifically for that kind of viewing. Mm -hmm. There's often a forest ranger there and somebody from Alaska Fish and Game, and uh, to be able to access Pat Creek, you have to um, stay in particular spots. And so basically the humans go where the humans go. So there's a spit that we'll sit on and we sit and we stay there. And then there's the place that um, uh, Al showed with the uh, bears up close with that kind of square of, um, of logs in a meadow in a meadow and basically what we're doing while we're there is we're observing the bears as they sort of move sort of with the ebb and flow of the tide so the bears are there primarily to eat clams and so they go out when the tide is out and they clam all day and then we try to be there about the time that they're moving up into the forest and into the um, the meadow and so they'll just pass by and Mostly what they do when they pass by is they look at us and then they kind of keep on going. And um, it's it's really exciting. And then when they're in the meadow, they're usually less. They're between 100 yards, maybe a little less. But um, it's all up to the bears. We're just there to observe. We're kind of as interesting to them as ravens are to them. So. So that kind of explains a little bit there, about. There's that. an interesting, an interesting background too. Is that a guy named Stan Price built a cabin at that spot? I don't, anyone know when that was exactly? 1951. Yeah. 1951, and and he and his wife uh, homesteaded there amongst the bears. There, Admiralty Island has more bears per square mile than any place on Earth, so there's no shortage of brown bears there. And he basically adopted a philosophy of of live and let live with the bears. They they roamed around his cabin. He used to carry a little stick. And if one of them got aggressive, he'd just tap it on the nose. And that was his 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 self-defense against the bears. Obviously, a long time ago, decades have gone by and generations of bears have become habituated so that the people are just part of their experience there. And so long as people are quiet and respectful and in small numbers, very controlled as it is there, it works amazingly well. They've just become habituated to people being there and they they couldn't care less. They just, yeah. they, they know we are not a well, threat. Well, uh, speaking of, uh, I was gonna say uh, the other threats that people are asking about in the, are about mosquitoes. 
<laughs> what is the mosquito situation? <laughs> we, are there bears? Is that a bear? in Alaska? The bears? <laughs> you're worried about bears and then you're worried about mosquitoes? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so what's interesting is Southeast Alaska in general doesn't have anywhere near the mosquito issue that you would find in Central Alaska. Um, and then because we're anchored offshore, um, we often have very little problem with bugs in general. And we do always have bug spray and stuff with us when we go ashore. And there are times when there are there are bug issues, but it's uh, we we don't recommend that anybody need to bring like a mosquito hood or anything. It's not it's not that same kind of experience you'd have if you were in the interior or up in the far north or something. If you're really interested I, in, in watching mosquitoes, I recommend the Brooks Range. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think I've ever put insect repellent on yeah. at all. I was just going to say the same. Neither have I. Yeah. It's yeah. Ne mosquitoes have never been an issue. Uh, a couple other questions that we have as far as um, people who might want a cane or to need uh, a cane while they're walking around. Uh, do you want to talk about that as far as stability? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, we, we do have, have people of all abilities. Uh -huh, yep, we uh, we have uh, uh, hiking sticks that we keep around um, for people to use going ashore so you don't have to pack those. Um, I'm always happy to give somebody a hand if they need uh, need something. But uh, yeah, we definitely keep uh, keep hiking, hiking sticks for people. And I really encourage them. Um, they're just the ground is somewhat uneven. And so it's always kind of nice to have a little something to to kind of fall on to if you would just kind of tip over a little bit or something. But um, yeah, also, and I, I often use one too. Also, most of our, what we call a hike, uh, doesn't cover very much ground. The spot at Pat Creek, you have to walk, the max there is about a quarter mile mm -hmm. from the, where I can put you off in the skiff to where that meadow with the bears, uh, where you can sit on the logs, mm -hmm. watch the bears. And, um, but, in general, the hikes aren't aren't super long. That's that's kind of one of the longer ones that we would do. That's and a quarter mile on the on the on a shoreline, a flat shoreline too. Yeah. yeah. We have had people in the past who have had mobility issues, mm -hmm. but we've never nobody's ever had a problem. Um, that's not a problem going slow and taking it easy. And as Christine was said, we're always there to help if there's a if there's a need. Um yeah. We've, like I said, we've had people with mobility issues with no problems. And I think one of the nice things about this area too is that we can go into places that you don't have to go very far. And, you know, as we've all, as, you know, John, Al, and I have spent a lot of time ashore, you don't like there's so much to see and do in a small place that you can spend hours and still feel like you're in um, a pretty amazing spot and you just, you don't need to go more than a you know mile or something, but um, I'd say pretty much the longest hike we would even do might be a half mile. And and by by virtue of the fact that the skiff is so extraordinarily nimble and can get us right into the, the exact place we want to go, we're not in a situation where the only place that we could land the skiff means a long walk to get to what we're trying to get to. I mean, Jeffrey's uh, brilliant at, at getting it right there. Um, additional questions we have about uh, typical camera lens kit and then also about drones um, in these areas. You want to talk about those before we get to food? One in of my favorite the, topic. In the national park, on the drone thing, in the national park, you aren't allowed to fly a drone. So on the Glacier Bay trip, the middle six days, you wouldn't be able to use it. Um, but we have had people use it on the, the day at the beginning and the day at the end. Um, outside of the national park, um, and uh, was able to do some interesting uh, photography over the top of some uh, humpback whales that were very close to the boat. Mm -hmm. um, and then in the Tracy Arm Ford's Terror area, uh, it's not actively regulated, but uh, as an operator in there with the Forest Service, we actually uh, are under a best management practices thing to try to restrict the use of drones. It is a wilderness area, even though the water technically isn't part of the wilderness area. And so drones are, are a little bit disruptive in wilderness areas. So, yeah. that, so we, we tend not to, 
use them much in, in those national forest areas. Yeah. Yeah, in terms of lenses, just to, to get to that other question, long lenses are very useful, particularly from shooting um, from the David V and for wildlife. Um, we, when we go ashore, uh, there's often need for all nature of lenses, including macro lenses. Wide angle lenses are, are fantastic when you're in these ice gardens. Um, so uh, you'd basically want uh, a full repertoire of lenses. Bring everything you've got. <laughs> and I always like to tell people, bring more lenses, bring less clothes. Um, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. You exactly. can be cold. Yeah, we'll Don't sell you about hoodies. That. Yeah, we'll sell you a hoodie. Um, I, I do uh, uh, want to ask, uh, there's a couple of questions about food as far as how do you take, uh, handle food allergies and also food preferences if somebody doesn't like Alaskan seafood. Right, yes, oh yes. Um, so I can pretty much handle most everything. Um, I'm pretty shy of extreme, uh, like some peanut allergies. I'm not sure that that would be appropriate, but most other allergies I've been able to, over the last 17 years, if I know what it is ahead of time, I can design my menus so that, um, so that it's not an issue. And then I have lots of substitutions that I do for people who are not fans of seafood. So, so that's easy. Um, even though I'm a baker by heart, uh, I can also, uh, set up, uh, meals that are gluten-free, um, all sorts of all sorts of vegetarian diets and stuff. So um, if you do have those issues, let Sarah know. And then if it's uh, if it's a really if it's a super extreme allergy, um, we can talk and and see see how how you feel if you're comfortable with it and if I'm comfortable with it. But typical seafood allergies I'm great with. I've had all sorts of different allergies on board. If you're allergic to delicious, don't come. <laughs> sure. <laughs> or grandeur. Yeah. If you're allergic to grandeur. Yeah. Um, a couple, uh, couple other questions. One, I want to, there was a question about battery charging facilities are available. And I think Jeffrey touched on that because we don't, we have our inverter and uh, all sorts of places to plug in. I think our general uh, rule of thumb is we want you to be awake and uh, alert while you're charging. Is there anything more you yep. to add to that? There's not, there's not much else. No. Um, yeah, we have lots of, uh, th they're outlets all over the place. Yeah, yeah we've had film we've, crews on the boat and they've been able to charge all their stuff. So we're pretty good with, <laughs> with the uh, um, photography workshops, being able to okay. charge everything. If it works for the BBC, it generally will work for us. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Charging um, has never been an issue. Yeah, yeah. I was always really impressed with how many uh, charging spots we have here. Um, and then the the other last two questions, I think, are wrapping it up here. Um, with regards to wildlife, we have, there's a question about, do we have a bird list? And then what is the best trip to view orcas? So. Mm, let's see. Yes. We I think this year, the best possible trip to see orcas would be the Alaska Fjords one, which is June 2nd through June 9th. Um, that is a good time uh, for when the seals are there pupping, which draws the orcas in. So that would be, I think, probably the best um, best opportunity. But that said, we have seen orcas throughout the season. Uh, we've seen them in Glacier Bay several times, actually pretty most most trips we've seen them in Glacier Bay. And then I'd say, how many, how often do you think we're we We're probably at like 60 or 70% of the time. Yeah, we see the orcas. orcas. See humpbacks, most all trips. So that's true. And then there was the bird list. Yes. There are lots and lots of birds that we'll see. And um, I'm a birder. So um, we don't have an actual list, though. Oh, yeah, I have it all in my <laughs> journals, but um, right. there are certain birds that you're interested in knowing about. Um, let me know and I will um, tell you whether or not we've seen it um, on the boat. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think uh, that's it for the questions we had. We did have a question about CPAPs. Uh, if people do travel with CPAPs, uh, we do have places within the staterooms to plug in. So that's pretty common uh, accommodation that we have for our passengers. But, um, you know, we're quarter past. Uh, we've, and I think we've pretty much questioned, there's a question about the puffins again. That's on our Glacier Bay trip primarily. Um, and then really, if you would like more information, Please let me know at the end of the 
uh, as you leave the meeting, there's a chance for you to give me your email if you'd like me to send more information. Uh, we will be putting together the recording for this and sending that out in a few days so that you can look at that again. Um, but again, there's our um, th there's our trip dates that are the photography ones. If you want to see uh, our schedule in general for all of our trips in 2023 and 2024, let me just put that in the chat here for everybody. This is our regular schedule and rates um, for this year and next. And we hope that you will consider joining us in the future. I want to thank Jeffrey and Christine and Al and John for all of their input on our photography workshops. Is there anything, final words that you'd like to share with everybody before we close up? I was gonna to say to go along with what you said, um, if you do have specific questions, like specifically for Christine about birds or for John or Al, um, you can always just send them to Sarah and she, yeah. she immediately forwards them on to us and then bugs us if we have not answered you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, uh, I was like, yeah, okay, this is not promise. your last chance. Yeah, yeah, this is not your last chance to ask questions. By yeah, if you have other questions, we're certainly available for mm -hmm. any anything like that. Yes, absolutely. And so, yeah, I want to say thank you so much for uh, coming uh, and listening to what we have to offer for our Alaska workshops. Um, they're some of my favorite trips that we do, and I definitely hope that you'll join us. John, Al, anything? Thanks, everyone. This was great fun. Yeah, yeah it's, it's hard to imagine if 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 you're passionate about photography and you love beauty, hard to imagine anything, any any trip anywhere in the world that really could compete with this. It's just great. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions or would like to make a reservation, visit our website, northwestnavigation.com, and click on Contact Us. You can also call us at 360-474-7218. Music is from Blue Dot Sessions. You can find them on the web at sessions.blue. Until next time, fair winds.